Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to see if I can see you guys here. Um, let me see here. Okay. <laughs> I can see messages popping up in the chat here. This is fantastic. Thank you guys so much for being here today. So this is uh, kind of new. Welcome if you haven't been here before. Uh, my name is Felicia from Sweet Georgia, and this is usually the time when we do Taking Back Friday, which is a video that we do uh, every Friday on this channel talking about how important it is to make time to make things and all these kinds of things. And today we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to do it as a live stream today. So I can see all of you guys in the chat here. Hello, Glenda, Annika, Chantal, um, Vicky, fantastic. Uh, I see everybody. Hey from Ottawa. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for being here. So <laughs> this is the video. This is the time where we talk about how important it is to carve out a chunk of time for your own creativity, for your own making. And the whole point of Taking Back Friday, if you haven't been following for a long time, is that it was really, really important to me to, to make time to uh, do my own making, to focus on my own creativity. It's really about honoring that creative side of you that you're not just you know, a parent or you're not just a student or you're not just an employee or you're not just anything. Like you are this other thing, which is you have creativity inside of you. You have desires to make things inside of you. And so to be able to honor that and prioritize that. Um, now, the funny thing is that I feel like probably many of you, I feel like I'm constantly short on time and that there is just never enough time to make things. And I know that at home, what I tend to do is I will try to wait until the end of the day I wait until all of the kids are asleep. I wait till all the dishes are done. I wait till like everything is tidied up before I allow myself that moment to sit down and to make anything, to sit at the loom or to spin or to do anything. And by that time, it's like 11 o'clock at night and I'm just completely exhausted. And so there's just so little left to do that. And so I had been talking about this with my husband over the past year. And he was saying, well, you know, if you do fiber arts for your work, for your business, for your work, then shouldn't you do it at work? Like you could do it at work. And I think that the interesting thing about that is that now I have these looms here in the studio and still it's really difficult to carve out that time to do this making work, even though what we do is we talk about knitting and we talk about weaving and we talk about spinning and all these kinds of things. And there's all these looms here. I still have that mentality where I'm like, I can't sit down at the loom until I've finished all my bookkeeping, until I have finished answering all the emails, which never happens, by the way. Um, but just all these things, there's always something that is taking time away, something that's pulling you away from sitting down and making things. And so that's why it's been so important to sort of like keep making these videos to really uh, remind both you and me how important it is to just, you, sometimes you have to stop and just say, okay, this is the time I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna actually sit down and make things. Now, ironically, making these Taking Back Friday videos actually takes a lot of time as well. And so um, one of the things that's been happening this past year is that I have been scheduling Tuesdays to film the videos ahead of time. Wednesdays, I edit the videos. And Thursday, then we upload, we make the thumbnails, and we do all the things that we need to do in order to get it ready to publish on Fridays. And so <laughs> it sounds a little bit strange, but it's almost like a week long activity to make the one video that is sometimes about 20 minutes long on a Friday. So it's a disproportionate amount of time that it takes to make the videos, which is, I think, funny <laughs> in some ways. Um, but also it's become a little bit more challenging because here in the studio, we do more than just film Taking Back Friday here. We obviously, we film classes and courses for the School of Sweet Georgia here. And so for the past couple of weeks, we've been filming uh, every week. So we've been filming with Amanda Wood. We've been f filming with Caitlin French. I'm gonna show you some of their samples because they're really, really cool. Um, but we've been filming with them here in the studio. And so my own time to sit and film these Friday videos has actually been cut short as well. And so I feel like um, it's a bit of a challenge and that's why today we're doing a live stream because we have no pre-recorded videos. Um, and so I think that for next year, 2022, one of the big things that I wanna be able to do is to reorganize my own schedule to figure out you know, how I can make these videos and how I can make them better. I really want to continue making these videos, but I just want to also make 
really good videos as opposed to just making a whole bunch of videos for every single Friday. And so um, it might require some different kinds of scheduling, might require um, doing fewer videos, it might require filming at home again. Like there's just a whole bunch of things that I have to work through in terms of figuring out how this could all be done. So I'm totally always open to suggestions too. And I can see so many of you guys in the chat here. Um, wonderful to see so many of you guys. And I recognize so many of you from the school as well. So that's really great to see you all here. Um, fantastic. Yes. Now, before we go on, I do want to talk about like the things that I've learned this year. I'm going to show you some of the projects, things that I've been working on and things that I want to work on for next year. But before I go ahead and do that, I do want to show you some of the things that are around me because I've spread many things around me and I'm really hoping that I don't knock anything over. Um, but I want to show you some of the stuff that's in the store very recently that we've just added to the store, but also some of the samples that have been made here at the studio as part of the filming for the past couple of weeks. So the first thing that I wanted to mention is that this is the cutest little color and weave gamp you can see here. Hopefully you can see there's a focus. That is a color and that's a color and weave gamp that is woven by Amanda Wood. And so Amanda Wood is one of the weaving instructors that we have in the School of Sweet Georgia. And she has filmed a color and weave on rigid heddle class. Uh, we, we filmed over three weeks and it was it's great. So this has all been woven with just yarns beam. And this is a yarn that I've used as well for the twill gamp project. Um, it's really nice cotton yarn. It's thick, it's dense, it's springy, it's very um, absorbent. It's just, it's a cool yarn to work with. A very, very interesting qualities that's different from other kinds of cotton like the 4A cotton or 8-4 cotton. Uh, but this is a color and weave gamp that you can come and learn to weave in probably about a couple of weeks. I think it comes out at the end of January or the beginning of February is when Amanda's course comes out. And so we talk a lot about like weaving on looms like I I weave on floor looms Amanda also in her in her life weaves on floor looms she does a lot of um, multi-layer multi-dimensional weaving she's also an artist she also does printmaking she she does a lot of things so I encourage you to go check out Amanda Wood at, and her website Amanda Wood textiles um, but yeah if you're interested in learning how to weave more with a rigid head of loom this class is coming out uh, in probably a month or so. And then what we're going to do is um, in January, I am leading that weaving study group that's going to be a study group about twills. But in the summertime, we're going to do another weaving study group. And it's going to be specifically about weaving on rigid heddle looms. So if this is something that you've been interested in and you just ah, finding it tricky to get started, then the summer weaving study group might be the one for you. And then you can join, bring your rigid heddle loom, and then start trying some different things out. So this is a project that's in there. Amanda also has uh, another class that she did with us, the Clasped Warp and Clasped Weft. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Um, and that she made like some beautiful scarves with these techniques all on rigid heddle. So that is there for you if you are interested. Now, I also mentioned that Caitlin French was in the studio recently. And so she came in to film this really fun class about eco printing with natural dyes. And so that is where you take like natural dye uh, stuff, like either cochineal bugs, raw cochineal bugs, or um, flowers that have a lot of pigment for dyeing, um, maybe like leaves. She's, she's collected a bunch of leaves from her neighborhood and saved, she saves them every fall. And so I'm gonna show you one of the samples that came from that class. It's really, really, really cool. And so this is an eco-printed sock blank that she made for us in that class. And so you can see here, there's like, oh wait, I'm mirror image. Here, you can see this is like a maple leaf, the skeleton of a maple leaf. There's other leaves here. Um, there's these dark sections are also leaves. The pink sections are cochineal bugs. I'm gonna hold it up real close. The yellow parts are different flowers, different dye flowers. It's really, really neat. Um, and so she shows a whole bunch of different ways of bundling the dyes. You can see these, these, uh, this sort of resist that happened because of the dyeing, I find to be the most interesting. It's like, it looks like birch trees in a forest, a forest of birch trees right here. So I, I quite enjoyed that. <laughs> 
So this is a sock blank, which you theoretically could unravel and then re-knit into something else. But it is just so pretty as is. We were talking about like, what if you just stuff this with a pillow and then sew up the end and then you have a pillow that's been eco-printed. But um, yeah, if you're interested in natural dyeing, interested in sort of this direct method of dyeing, then this class is coming out later on in 2022, probably about spring, summer sort of time when it seems feasible to um, sit and do some natural dyeing. I want to see your comments, but the screen keeps turning off. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so those are the two projects that uh, we have recently filmed that are going to go up into the school in the new year. I also wanted to show you the stuff that I have over here and some other things that have gone into the um, into the Sweet Georgia store. And so this is Sweet Georgia. We dye a lot of yarn, but one of the things that we have not ever really ever dyed is alpaca. We never dye alpaca. Um, probably a lot of reasons for that, but uh, the alpaca tends to dye, when we dye it, it dyes a little bit lighter. Um, it does have sort of like a much more hazy, muted appearance, and so we've never really picked up alpaca as one of the lines to dye for ourselves, but we like the fiber and we enjoy working with it. And so we did bring on a little bit of alpaca yarn to put into the store at Sweet Georgia. And so we have here, this is also made by Gist. So Gist Yarn is a yarn company that's very interesting because they're making a lot of weaving yarns from scratch. They're designing their own weaving yarns. And so this is one of the new yarns that they've come up with. It's called Ode and it's 100% alpaca. This color is beautiful. This is totally, totally my color. <laughs> um, and you can see this is a nice big cone of uh, alpaca. There's another one, another color in sort of oatmealish color. There's a whole bunch of colors. We got all of the colors. And then here's another one. So all of these things, you could, can, you know, combine them together and make a scarf. You could make a shawl. You could make a blanket. Um, the set for this is probably about eight ends per inch for plain weave and anywhere from 10 to 12 for twill. You might want to sort of veer on the tighter side, the tighter side of set for twill because the alpaca is a little bit slinky, it's a little bit drapey, and so to have it, you know, pull together a little bit more would be nice in the fabric. So that is one of the alpaca yarns. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. You could use this to knit a sweater, you could knit a shawl out of this, you knit off the cone. Sometimes people really like knitting off the cone because then there are fewer balls of yarn to join together, so that is nice. Um, the other alpaca yarn that we have here is this one. So this one is more like fuzzy cloud-like alpaca. Um, we do make a, a mohair yarn that has this fuzziness to it, but this one is kind of like cloud-like, well, it's called Cumulus. <laughs> it's called Cumulus and it's by Fiber Spates. And this one has 74% baby Surrey alpaca in it and 26% mulberry silk. So it's silk and alpaca blended together. You could carry this along as one strand um, and make a really like cozy hat or you could run it along with all sorts of other yarns in order to give it a little bit more strength, more body, um, or I could imagine knitting a very very loose and lacy shawl with all of this stuff. This is also possible but this again is alpaca and silk together. have a couple of other things in here. So this is another wool that we brought on earlier this fall. And um, this is an interesting wool. This is from Finland. This is a Finnish wool. It's called Tuku wool. And we brought this on because it's woolen spun. It has very, very much of a, like a toothy quality to it. Um, and it would make for really beautiful sweaters. Uh, it makes for really good color work. So they, we have it in sort of a, a thicker weight and we also have it in a thinner weight as well. So this thicker weight looks like it's about DK, yeah, it is DK weight. And then the thinner one is more like a fingering weight. So there's two different weights of this particular yarn. But I just love the colors. They have that kind of a heathered quality to them. They're a little bit gray. I wonder if I can get a better shot of this. If you can see. So you can see a little bit like of the heathered quality of it. It's got some grays and it's sort of natural wool colors in here. And then the color itself of the yarn is actually very vibrant. So um, those are two of the colors that I liked. And then this one for sure, like I could definitely make a sweater out of all of that. That's really pretty. 
So those are some of the yarns that are in the studio. I also wanted to show you guys some of the other things that we have made sort of in preparation for the weaving study group that starts in January because we have two big courses coming with Laura Fry for weaving and then I have my weaving study group. And so we did a bunch of things like <laughs> I designed this little um, tool, this little wooden tool here, and it's like a right angle tool. It's made out of walnut wood, and it has a ruler on one side, and then here there's like a little notch cut out that's a one inch notch. And so part of when I was going through all of this weaving for the twill gap and everything like that, one of the important things is to measure your twill angle and to make sure that it's a 45 degree angle all the time. And so this is, um, you can see it's a 45 degree angle. And I just put this on my cloth and just measure to make sure that my angle of my twill is matching up with this line so that I know that I'm getting sort of um, the same number of picks per inch as ends per inch and I'm making a balanced cloth as I'm weaving. So this is kind of like a weaving tool, calling it like a weaving right angle tool. And then this little notch, you can use it to count your ends per inch and your picks per inch to make sure that you're getting a balanced cloth. So this is just like a nice handy tool that I I felt like I needed to have as I was sitting here at the loom and so we just we wanted to make it and have it available so this is available now in the school as well um, if you hadn't seen before we also make a spinning gauge tool so this one is it for if it's not focusing on it in any case, this one gives you sort of like a one inch notch and a half inch notch, and it also has angles for if you want to measure your twist angle as you're spinning. So that's another thing that we have. Um, and another thing that I think we have on the website now is we also made needle gauges, brand new needle gauges for Sweet Georgia. So these are knitting needle gauges, and then again, a little one inch notch cut out here at the top if you're wanting to measure stitches for, you know, number of stitches per inch, all of that kind of stuff. So that is available as well. And then speaking about tools, when Laura came to film with us earlier uh, in the fall, she came to teach us about efficient weaving. And it's actually, I'll show you. A lot of the stuff is in her book. It's here, The Intentional Weaver, How to Weave Better. And a lot of the content that we put into the course is specifically from this book. And so we do have the book. We have Laura's book on our website as well. So if you want to pick this one up, it is so much wonderful information. And um, so this book, she also talks about this particular tool. And all of these things in this Intentional Weaver are about um, helping to make your your body movements, making your physical weaving processes, making them a lot more efficient, more productive, all of these kinds of things. And so this tool is one that Laura recommended for both threading the heddles um, and then also slaying the reed. So you kind of just turn it around. This is a Harrisville um, threading hook. It's a brass threading hook from Harrisville. And so previously I'd always used different things for threading the heddles. Sometimes I just fold the yarn and use my fingers. And I would just do that because I was always saying that, oh, I didn't find a threading hook that was comfortable enough to hold in order to do that. So I just use my fingers to thread all the heddles. But in this case, she introduced me to this tool. And now I have like three of them. I have one at each loom because I want to use these all the time. They are fantastic. It's very comfortable to hold. It doesn't feel like there's other... Um, it's sort of heddle hooks that are feel very awkward, but this one actually feels quite comfortable and you can use it to get the length to reach in and pull threads out in the heddles. And so this has been really, really great to have. And then also flipping it around and being able to slay the reed really efficiently. So this we also have on the website now. So a couple of things for you guys to go and check out if you are wanting to participate in that weaving study group. These are all very, very helpful things to have for that. Okay, now, what else do I have here? Oh, okay, so we had some other things I wanted to share with you guys that are also from the store. And the first one is that we do bring in a bunch of the Lina stuff. So we have a bunch of Lina books as well. So this one happens to be the 52 Weeks of Socks, which is a beautiful, beautiful pattern book. Um, and just beautiful photography. You guys are probably familiar with this book. 
but it's just, it's beautiful. This is like a very lovely, like, I don't want to say coffee table book, but I used to buy cookbooks that were like this, that were just so beautiful that you could barely use them. But I mean, you probably don't want to cook with a beautiful cookbook on your kitchen table, you know, as you're making dinner. But this one you could definitely knit from because you're not going to get it dirty. But this is really, really lovely. So 52 weeks of socks. We also had some shawl ones as well, but those ones I wanted to sh show you. And then, where can I put this? And then one other thing that I wanted to sort of um, sh tell you about, if you haven't yet seen it, um, there is an online magazine, it's an online Canadian magazine, it's called Digits and Threads. And so this has been created by Kim Worker and Kate Atherley, both whom you may uh, recognize from many other, many, many other things. So Kim has been a long time crochet, uh, sort of, she was an interweave crochet editor for a while. She was, um, worked at Craftsy doing, or she made crochet classes for Craftsy. So there's a lot of crochet things that you can learn from Kim. But Kim is also um, doing tons of editing work. She's been an editor in the craft industry for, for a long, long, long time. And then Kate Atherley, you guys may know, she, uh, design well she's written the, the custom sock book the custom fit sock book um, she's written a ton of books about like pattern writing and different kinds of patterns she's also the technical editor for nitty uh, just this this combination of, of of craft people is phenomenal so they got together and created an online magazine in Canada called digits and threads and one of the most recent things that they released is a pattern called the bespoke cardigan you guys might have seen this on um, social media but I wanted to share it with you as well um, and this is you can see this is this is Holly and then this is her dad, Nigel. And um, so Holly Yo, we've worked with in the past as well. Holly Yo is a knitwear designer. We worked with her on the Tempest book, maybe like six years ago, something like that. And um, she's designed this pattern, which is supposed to be uh, gender and size inclusive design. So it doesn't matter what size you are, doesn't matter who you are, what, you know, your body shape, if you have broad shoulders, narrow shoulders, long torso, short torso, all of these things she has put together into this pattern to make something that is like going to fit and flatter every kind of body. And so it's a quite a large pattern. I think there are 29 pages to this pattern so it's very very large it's a bit on the epic side of things uh, but it's a beautiful story and a beautiful um it's a beautiful it's a beautiful concept you know to be able to make a pattern that would fit and flatter anyone and um so this one is actually made with our yarn it's the superwash uh dk the sweet georgia superwash dk is what she used for the sweater but you know holly's been online talking a little bit about the pattern and i believe that there's an article about it on digits and threads and so i really encourage you to check out the pattern and um just check out the story and the intention behind all of this and i think it's a really really wonderful thing and i just wanted to highlight that for you if you are looking for a cardigan pattern to knit in 2022 and you wanted something a bit on the epic side then this is something that i encourage you to check out And then finally, we just have this one thing that I wanted to show you. So this is from Sweet Georgia. This looks like a party of five, but it is not. So we have for many, many years been making these mini skein sets, which are all made out of Tough Love sock. And they're just all different colors, gradient colors, all that kind of stuff. And this one is not a Tough Love sock mini skein set. This one is called the Knitter's Delight, and it has a mini skein of all different kinds of yarn bases so that you can test and try and sample and see if you like them or what you like. So in this set here, there is Cash Lux Spark, BFL and Silk Fine, Flax and Silk Fine, Cash Lux Fine, which is a cashmere blend sock yarn, and then Mohair Silk Sock. So all different kinds of fingering weight yarns, just all a little bit different, but it just gives you the opportunity to try them and to see how they feel, to see how they behave. They're all a little bit different. They're all fingering weight, but they're all a little bit different. And so I really like this color combination. It's just very fruity and tropical and fun. Um, 
yeah, so that is available as well. So those are the things that are in the store that I wanted to highlight and tell you guys about. And I'm just going to double check my chat here. Because all of these messages showed up and I didn't see any of them. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So I also wanted to tell you a little bit about sort of what I learned this year. So um, I wanted to kind of recap for you the things that I have learned this year, things that I've been focusing on, things that I've been working on. I have obviously been doing a lot of weaving, but um, I also spent a lot of time this year, um, maybe unintentionally, but it, it happened that I did end up, I feel like I improved my spinning a lot. Um, and I'd gone for many years being a little bit frustrated with my spinning. Um, I was like, I was making yarn, I'm making colorful yarn, I am making yarn. Um, but there was something about the feel of my yarn that I just didn't really enjoy. And then once I finished making the yarn, I didn't feel as compelled to do anything with it because I didn't like the feel of it. And so this year, having, you know, worked with so many wonderful instructors who have come into the studio and I've had the um, amazing sort of first-hand opportunity to learn from them and to see them do the things that they do and we film these things so that we can share them with you as well but um, I learned a lot of different ways of drafting a lot of different ways of pre attenuating fiber of making sure that there's air in the fiber uh, different ways of preparing the fiber in order to be spun all of these things have really really helped and so in the fall uh, Greta and Vicky, Vicky, who is in the, the chat here today, um, they helped moderate a, a study group, a spinning study group in the School of Sweet Georgia. And the last time I checked, there was like 200 people in there learning how to spin and doing very deep exploration of their spinning. And so as part of that study group, I decided that I wanted to spin six skeins of yarn. And so I'm going to, I'll show you here. So these are the six skeins of yarn that I spun for the study group. And the idea was that they were all using sort of different colorways. This is, these are all new colorways that we came out with in the fall for Sweet Georgia. And so like this is gemstones. Um, I can't remember all the names. I think this is feast. No, this is farm to table. This is movable feast. <laughs> I have the worst memory. <laughs> so in any case, these are all the colors that I was working with. And um, what I did was in order to make this yarn, I wanted to make a three ply yarn. I wanted it to be about worsted weight and I wanted it to be like soft and squishy enough so that I would want to use it for knitting. And so I'm actually really happy with the yarn that I produced. Uh, it feels much more cushy and soft and the hand of it just feels a lot better. So I, I do like that. Um, the pattern that I wanted to make was the Andrea Maori uh, night shift, the big shawl, because I had made the shift cowl and the shift cowl uses two ply yarn, much finer yarn. Um, that yarn was really, really great. But I started to knit the night shift. This is the big worsted weight version of the shawl so you can kind of see my pattern here so the way that the color distribution was working with all of these little skeins of yarn i wanted to have long color transitions um, but you can see that the long color transitions don't really show a lot of effect because some of these sections are still so short and so i'm trying to figure out if i like this or if I want to rip it out <laughs> and start over. I've already ripped it out one time because I didn't like what was happening down here. Um, and it's just sort of like looking at all of these skeins and trying to figure out, well, at what, what point in time do I want what colors to cross with what colors? Do I want this blue color to match with this green color here? Do I want those to sort of go together? Or do I want this this red color to kind of mix in? You know, I, I had put the red color in and then I ripped it out because it was just a little bit too jarring, but maybe the red color, this magenta color would be okay if it was against more of a purple rather than a blue. And <laughs> so I feel like I'm a little bit overthinking all of this, um, that if maybe if I just knit it as is, the whole thing would just come together at the end of the day as this big giant shawl with all the colors mixing and blending together 
and it would all work overall. But right now, because I'm looking at it line by line, I, I just, like the blues and the purples have all sort of mixed together here into something that's incoherent. So it's nice because it's all kind of a gradient of purple, but at the same time, I can't see what's going on. I don't see any colored dots anymore, so I don't know if I like it. I don't know what you guys think. Um, I'm sure that many of you have made this shawl or made this pattern or made some form of the shift pattern. And so if you have designed your own from scratch, I would, I would love to hear about what your thought process was like around mixing and blending all these colors together because I am not 100% sure of all of this. Should I rip it out? Should I not rip it out? <laughs> yeah, so um, Amanda is saying analogous rather than complementary where possible. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. So I mean, I do like what's happening here. The blue and the purples together are really, really nice. Um, the green and the purple here, I feel like it's just too much. And then this purple and the gold here, again, is just, it's too much. Um, so that is going to require a little bit of work. <laughs> so well, maybe in 2022, you will see that I have finished this shawl and all of the things. So I'm going to put this here for now and make some space. Um, but yeah, this is the other thing that I have been working on. So um, you guys will know that this year I wove many, many of these twill gamps. This is one of them. This is the one that we're going to be making in the weaving study group. That is the third one of those that I wove. Uh, this is the fourth gamp that I wove. This is the one that's in BFL and Silk Fine. Also really lovely. And I decided because I wanted to work with some new yarn, new to me yarn, um, I decided to make another twill gamp in this new yarn. And so each of the colors of this yarn I actually bought a kilo of each color. So I bought 10 kilos of yarn because that was the minimum that I needed to buy. <laughs> um, but it's a little bit overwhelming how much yarn there is. Um, and so what I wanted to do was I decided to make the gamp. So it's actually under here. You can't see it right now, but the actual color gamp, uh, the actual twill gamp has been rolled onto the front beam here. But I have all this warp left over that I want to weave off. And so this is the twill gamp uh, with instead of using white as the uh, warp yarn I'm using this indigo color which is really really lovely um, and separating them out with this sort of magenta color I think they called it raspberry and this part of it I'm weaving another gamp uh, basically using different colors for each section of the patterns just to um, you know see how the different colors interact see you know what do each one of these colors do when they are mixed and blended together with the um, with this navy indigo color so I'm hoping to make it through all of the ten colors see all the different color combinations see what happens and then out of this maybe I can extrapolate one of these sections and then make something much much bigger so that's kind of what the plan is. I have still quite a bit of warp on here, so I just want to weave it off. And then after this has been woven off, um, what I really want to do is basically just cut this off and then wear it. Like, I'm not going to wear the twill gamp that's on there because it looks like a twill gamp. I think that, I don't know. I don't think that wearing a twill gamp, I mean, maybe it looks like a scarf, but <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. But with the color one, I do want to weave like a long length and I'm going to wear it so that I can see how the fabric wears. If it pills, if it does any weird things, if it stretches out, if it becomes felted, like what happens to this fabric when you go and actually wear it? So that is basically what is on here right now. So I've been doing a lot of spinning things this year, doing a lot of this weaving here, weaving a lot of twill gamps this year. I feel like um, after the study group in January, I think I'm, I'm ready to weave something else. I, I'm feeling very, very ready. Um, the other thing that you guys might have seen is that a couple months ago, Greta and I went to the fleece auction and we ended up purchasing um, three fleeces. So we got one that's a polled dorset, which is actually a meat sheep. And we got the fiber from that because it was like spongy and springy and bouncy and just really cool. So we got one of those. And then there were two um, fleeces that were both Gotland Romney crosses that were really, really lovely. And so we wanted to, we bid on those and actually won those as well. And so um, 
these fleeces uh, were split among about nine other spinners altogether. I think there was nine spinners altogether. And so for the past several weeks, actually, we all got together with Kim McKenna, who's also a teacher in the school here, and um, we learned how to wash the fleece from scratch, like how to wash the fleece. And then uh, Kim was very, very uh, methodical in teaching us how to spin woolen. So how do we card Rolex? And so she gave us Cordell, just commercial combed uh, Cordell top to work with first. And so we learned how to comb and uh, we learned how to card regular Cordell. We learned how to make Rolex. And then after we were skilled enough at that, then we started to comb and card um, other kinds of fleece, other kinds of raw fleece that had been washed. So Kim brought some fleece that had been washed. And so we were experimenting with different kinds of sheep breeds. Um, she showed us one that was called Bond. She showed us one that was uh, BFL lamb's wool. It was like the first shearing of a BFL lamb. Super, super beautiful, silky, silky fiber. Um, what else did we spin? We spun a little bit of Gotland, uh, spun a little bit of Romney, I think, just like a whole bunch of different kinds of fibers so that we have an idea, like a reference for how do these different sheep breeds feel. Um, and this whole time we washed the pulled dorset, but we weren't really allowed to touch it yet until we had developed these skills with being able to card raw fiber. And then after that, after learning how to card it, into Rolex, then we were learning to spin. So spinning woolen with a short woolen draw, uh, sort of a backward woolen draw, and then with a long draw American style, and then a long draw English style, so an English long draw. Um, so just gradually, step by step by step by step, developing these skills to be able to spin woolen really, really, really well, so that we can go back and now know how to um, actually spin the fleece that we bought. And so this is a huge, huge, I feel like a huge jump in my own personal learning this past year about learning to work with fleece. And I think that there's just gonna be more <laughs> next year. So I think with this group of, of nine spinners, the goal was that at least uh, by next year, we have uh, finished washing, processing, spinning, and hopefully making into something the fleeces that we bought and just ahead of the uh, the next auction so that way maybe we would be ready to participate again in the next auction should that event come up. Um, so there's a little bit of that happening as well. So I see Michelle saying, I am in for a fleece class. <laughs> Um, and Amanda's saying that's so exciting. Amanda's already, you've, you've worked with fleece already before. So um, yeah, I, I've always, I've purchased fleece before. I've just never really spent a ton of time washing the fleece and, and going through that entire process. So this is all very exciting for me as well. Um, yeah, I'm curious about like how you guys are at the end of this year, like end of 2021. What do you feel like you've spent the most time learning? Uh, what's been good? What's been hard? Um, what do you want to do next year? I know that for myself next year, I am going to be doing tons more weaving, <laughs> tons and tons more weaving. I was very excited about that first overshot sample that I started weaving. Just, and I read about this experience too after I'd done my, my overshot experience, but just like putting in those picks of supplementary weft and seeing how they create patterns on something as simple as a four shaft loom was just really amazing. And so I'm really interested in learning a little bit more about that. Um, I have recently also taken a double weave class with Jennifer Moore, who wrote the book on double weave. It's amazing. If you haven't seen the book, uh, Double Weave to Her Revised and Expanded Edition, I encourage you to check that book out. Um, Jennifer is also teaching her Double Rainbow class um, in a lot of different venues. I think it should be up on her website probably fairly soon, if it's not already. But next year she will be teaching this workshop again. Um, <clears throat> but I took this workshop and it was fantastic really amazing it was like a treat to me to take this workshop um, I, I, I got it for myself as my birthday present <laughs> in the summer and it was really really wonderful to work through all of that with her but um, 
but we had already sort of planned in the school that we're going to do some double weave classes. And so I'd mentioned Amanda Wood weaving on rigid heddle looms. We've asked Amanda to prepare some teaching about how to weave double width on a rigid heddle loom. And then I am going to be teaching double width on a four shaft loom. So looking at ways of like, how do you make a fold? How do you, how do you make this fabric into two layers? All of these kinds of things. So that's all going to be coming out hopefully near the middle of the year next year and then some of this overshot stuff as well so there's a lot of stuff that i want to do with my weaving because i want to get more knowledgeable about like weaving structures and understanding it's a bit of a puzzle to me like i will see woven cloth and i'll wonder how was that made like how did they make the different shafts and what did the loom do in order to do those things and so I want to know the weaving structure and be able to recognize weaving structures right away. And then on top of that, I want to be able to overlay this idea of like hand dyed yarn, hand painted yarn. Um, and I want to do just more dyeing specifically for weaving next year. And so that's kind of my goal. Um, yeah, that's kind of my goal, my shrug. My shrug is not hand woven, Shelly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My sh this one is not hand woven. This is actually um, just a. This is from where is it from? It's from Lululemon, <laughs> but it is um, it is knitted, and I think a lot about making something that's very similar to this. And this is the reason why I'm making this cloth on the loom right now is that I was going to take this cloth and then weave it and then sew it together in order to make a shrug that's like this. I feel like you could very easily um, knit. A giant rectangle and also sew it into something like this but this is a is very comfortable it's just like a giant long rectangle that's been sewn fantastic so nice to see everybody here in the chat so much conversation I can't read <laughs> everything that's happening here um, but yeah fantastic so yeah, I'm curious about what you guys are interested in learning next year. That's kind of where my plan is for next year. I'm always going to be knitting something. Um, my knitting is it's very contextual. So the idea that um, I'm going to be knitting when I'm sitting in the car, I'm going to be knitting when I'm you know, standing at soccer practice. Those are the times that I knit. Um, everything else is kind of requires dedicated time, right? It requires me to sit at the loom and be here for this activity. It requires me to sit at a spinning wheel for that activity. And so um, if I get those opportunities to sit, then I would do those two activities. Uh, whereas like the knitting, I just would carry it around with me and do it wherever I can fit it in. And then the other thing that I've talked about before is also like that knitting makes my arms go numb. <laughs> so that's a bit of an issue. Yeah, so fantastic. So I would love to know if you guys enjoy this format. Uh, if you guys think that we should continue on with this kind of format, I feel like this is way, way longer than a typical Taking Back Friday video, which is normally about 15 to 20 minutes long. Um, but this is way longer. And um, it's neat to be able to see you guys in the chat. Um, and just wondering if you guys would like to do this uh, in the future. You can just leave that in the chat and I will come back and read it. So many, so many messages. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you guys so much for being here. I want to wish everybody a wonderful, wonderful holiday season. We are not going to have any videos until the new year in January because we're going to be launching the class with Laura Fry on the Intentional Weaver. I already have the topic planned, but I'm going to basically tell you about all the times that I was mortified weaving in front of a master weaver. That is basically the next topic for our video. Um, but yeah, I hope that you guys have a wonderful holiday season. I hope that you have time to rest and feel rejuvenated and just, you know, just let your brain relax into some crafting time and to enjoy all of that together. Thank you guys so much for being here today and I will see you in the next one in the new year. All right. Thank you. Bye.